are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, Chapter Leadership Committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. Hello, Jeremy. How are you doing, Cindy, during this kind of unusual holiday season? <laughs> well, um, I am staying safe and hanging in there. Since I'm used to working on holidays, it's actually nice to be home for a change. How about you? Well, uh, not a lot. My wife and I will be in contact with a couple of siblings around Christmas time. Maybe we'll do a Zoom call, something like that, but uh, no gatherings of any kind. Mm -hmm. uh, I also hope to get up to the Nubble Lighthouse in York. It's only a half hour north of here. Uh, York, Maine, to see the lights they always put on the lighthouse and the other buildings this time of year. Oh, me too. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I put some lights on Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse uh, recently also. Thank you for that. We couldn't have our usual work party there to put up the lights, but hopefully we'll get back to that next year. Definitely. So this is episode 94 of Lighthearted, coming into the world on December 21st, 2020. On this date, in 1771, the original twin lighthouses on Thatcher Island off the east side of Cape Ann, Massachusetts, were first lighted. It was the last light station to go into operation in the American colonies before the revolution started. Thatcher Island was also the first American light station established to mark a dangerous ledge instead of marking the entrance to a harbor. A pair of 124-foot granite towers replaced the original 45-foot towers in 1861 with first-order Fresnel lenses. The light station was declared a National Historic Landmark in 2001. The Thatcher Island Association now cares for the towers and other light station buildings. On December 21st, 1937, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs premiered. It was the world's first full-length animated feature. On the morning of December 21st, 1970, President Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley met at the White House. And on this date in 1940, the American musician and songwriter Frank Zappa was born in Baltimore, Maryland. He once said, quote, a mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open, unquote. Okay, uh, I think we need a good segue here. Uh, Frank Zappa played some famous concerts at the Fillmore West Theater in San Francisco. And today we're going to San Francisco Bay to talk about the East Brother Light Station, which is operated as a B&B. &B. A little later, we're going to listen to another installment of Florida Lighthouse History with Ralph Krugler. First, Cindy, please help me tell everyone about East Brother Light Station and our guest. Sure, Jeremy. San Pablo Street, between San Francisco Bay to the south and San Pablo Bay to the north, is only a little more than a mile wide. With frequent fog and numerous rocks and islands in the vicinity, navigating through the strait was a challenge. The San Joaquin River provided access from San Pablo Bay to Stockton, Sacramento, and other inland ports. As commerce grew, aids to navigation around San Pablo Strait became a necessity. In March 1871, Congress appropriated funds for a lighthouse on the east side of San Pablo Strait. It was decided that East Brother Island, about a thousand feet offshore on the east side of the strait, would be a good location. A San Francisco contractor began building the lighthouse in early 1873. The style chosen was the handsome stick style design developed by architect Paul Pels and used for several other West Coast lighthouses around the same time. A square wooden tower was attached to a six room keeper's dwelling. On March 1st, 1874, a fourth order lens was put into operation for the first time. The station was assigned a principal keeper and two assistants. John Stenmark, a native of Sweden, served two decades as principal keeper beginning in 1894. He and his wife, Bretta, had two daughters when they arrived, and two more daughters were born in their years on the island. The Stenmarks maintained a vegetable garden and raised chickens, rabbits, goats, and pigs on the island. Their children were taught by a teacher on the island at first, but were later rowed across to Richmond for school. Near 3 a.m. on March 4, 1940, Keeper Willard Miller was filling a container with gasoline from a drum in the boathouse to be used in a generator. Miller inadvertently knocked over a kerosene lamp and fire quickly spread across the floor. 
The fire was soon out of control, causing several drums of gasoline to explode. As the keepers battled the flames, a Coast Guard boat raced to the scene from San Francisco. It took two hours to put out the flames, and the boathouse, four boats, the wharf, and a tramway were a complete loss. The light station was automated and de-staffed in the summer of 1969. The building deteriorated for a decade until the Coast Guard granted a license for restoration to a new nonprofit organization, East Brother Light Station Incorporated. The lighthouse was lovingly restored with the help of much volunteer labor, and by late 1980, the doors were opened for overnight guests. There are five guest rooms at the station, four in the former keeper's dwelling, and one in the fog signal building. This year, the COVID-19 pandemic forced the bed and breakfast operation to close down at the end of June. The resident caretakers left, and a longtime board member, Desiree Hevero, moved in as the resident keeper. Desiree has worked as a dental assistant and as a personal assistant, and as a volunteer for an emergency service department. She's also a former board member of the Richmond Museum Association. I recently had the chance to speak with Desiree Hevero. Let's listen to that conversation now. I am speaking today with Desiree Hevero, who is the uh, resident caretaker or station keeper of the East Brother Lighthouse in California. Thank you so much for joining me today, Desiree. Thank you, Jeremy. And how is the weather in uh, Richmond, California today? Well, fall has come, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Last night we had gale force winds up to 30 miles an hour. Uh, my little weather monitoring station said, hold on to your hat. <laughs> wow. There's eucalyptus bark all over the island, which I will be cleaning. Oh, after. boy. <laughs> Sounds like fun. That must be an interesting place to be in, in rough weather, to be uh, on the island there. It's It's been so interesting because, I, you know, I expected our gorgeous, usual California sun all summer, but we had all the fires. Right. And, you know, we're right smack in the middle of, you know, all the directions of wind. So we were, like, smothered by the smoke. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Were there days when you couldn't even go outside because of that? Could not. Couldn't have the windows open. I had to have an air purifier going at all times. Wow. It was pretty bad. Wow. But that's uh, over with, I hope. You still getting some smoke lately? Um, Not right now, luckily. Yeah. Well, let's hope. Uh, obviously, we all hope for the, the best with all that. It's been, been a pretty terrible situation. So I'm glad it's you're getting a reprieve from that currently. So let's talk a little bit about your involvement before we talk about the, the island and the light station and, and those types of things. You are a volunteer and board member for East Brother Light Station. You have been for a number of years. I'm not sure how long you have been, but I think it's at least seven or eight years, something like that, right? And right. maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you got involved. It's the strangest thing. I was driving home from San Rafael with my daughter. As you know, we're right off. You can see us from the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. And I saw this Victorian floating on an island. And I, I can't quite describe the feeling, but it, it was there. It took maybe about eight years after that for me to really fully get involved. I started as a wiki. That's what we call our volunteers. It's kind of a throwback to the days of, you know, lighting the wick. <laughs> Wikis come out the second Saturday of every month, rain or shine, to help keep the old girl in good shape. And I did that for about three or four years. And the board was looking for someone to help with marketing and that sort of thing, social media. So I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll take that on too, but I'd like to have a little bit more say-so. And I'd like to join the board. The board enthusiastically welcomed me. And it has been that way ever since. So, Desiree, what do you think is, is special about East Brother Island and the lighthouse? That might be hard to answer in a, in a few words, but what would you say to that? There is no place like it. First, that makes it unique, which makes it special. There's, I don't know how to explain this without sounding kind of kooky, but... There's a snow globe quality to it, I like to say. We are not that far from the mainland, but when you're here, it feels like you're a million miles away from everything. It feels like you're consumed by its magic and its glow. It's uh, truly 
a very special place. I don't think that somebody could be unhappy here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, having been there five years ago, I, I, I think that's a perfect description. Uh, that's beautifully said, what you just said, and the snow globe quality. I love that. Have there been any East Brother Island snow globes manufactured? If not, there should be. <laughs> there, there most certainly should be. But instead of little snowflakes flying around, it should be miniature seagulls. Yeah, there you go. Little plastic seagulls. So I know things are, are very different right now, have been very different this season because of the pandemic, obviously. Things are different for all of us. But let's put that aside for the moment. Can you describe what the experience is like for people who come to stay overnight at the light station? And part two of the, the uh, that question is, could you describe the accommodations? Absolutely. The experience and the price tag, which in my opinion is far too low, but we want to make it accessible for everyone, gives people maybe the wrong impression sometimes. We've had people hire a limo service to drive them out, show up in fancy heels and that sort of thing. It's special like that, but it's not. Um, when you come, you know, come in clothes that are going to be comfortable. You've got to climb a ladder. You might get wet. Um, that sort of thing. It's all a part of the experience. The microclimates and the winds could vary. The animals can vary. So your experience truly is one of a kind. When you arrive by boat, you know, we provide the transportation for. When you arrive to the island by boat, you are greeted with champagne and appetizers. Um, you're given a quick tour of the main house, the light tower. And get settled into your room and then it's dinner time where we offer a four course gourmet meal and uh, dessert is included in that of course too um, you're free to walk around the island we've got a horseshoe pit we've got a game room a parlor that sort of thing um, in the morning there's the full breakfast and the demonstration of the fog signal building with our historic machinery that still works you know things that were built to last. And then, you, you know, you come back, come back to the mainland begrudgingly. And the accommodations are uh, in the main Victorian, we have four rooms, the Marin room, the San Francisco room, West Brother room, and the Two Sisters room. And then in the Fog Signal building, we have Walter's Quarters, which is a little bit more private, a little rustic. However, we have taken the opportunity um, during this free time that we have to do some renovations. Walter's Quarters has been completely renovated. So that'll be a nice treat for the guests when they're able to come back. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I was there in 2015. I didn't get to stay overnight, but I got a night, really nice tour of the place from the uh, innkeepers who were there at that time. And uh, it's it's just it's so beautiful. I hope maybe someday I can stay overnight there. You just referenced the food, the gourmet meals, and the full breakfast and everything. Uh, could you get a little little more specific about what kind of food people get when they stay there? And maybe you could say something about what some, what some of your favorites are. Certainly. Uh, so it definitely depends on who the keepers are, what kind of foods that they make, and how ambitious they are with our garden. We've had some keepers that are extremely ambitious, so you get like straight farm-to-table ingredients, but we do make it a point to let the keepers know that they've got to be shopping local, organic, that sort of thing. So you'll typically start off with like a soup, a salad, you know, your entree, and your dessert. Those are the, the four courses, and those can, can range. We had a set of keepers recently where um, Cabby, the California Bed and Breakfast um, Inn, shared their a salad recipe that they have. It's a like a it was a goat cheese salad with you know wild radishes. It was exceptionally visually stunning, very easy to make and quite delicious. Wow, sounds good to me. So I'm sure we could talk about food for a while, but uh, when do we move on? I, I understand there's still an automatic modern electronic fog signal, right? An operation there? Correct. Yeah. The thought occurs to me, and I'm sure it occurs to a lot of people, they probably ask you about it when they're going to stay there, if they know about the fog signal. Does that ever interfere with the overnight stays? It depends. Some people don't mind. There is a soundtrack that is playing 24-7 here of waves and boats and right. wildlife. And so that just sort of adds to it. 
as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But there are occasionally people who will be kept up a little. Uh, we've got earplugs for them. And it's not all year. It's October through March that that signal is going. Okay. In fact, the Coast Guard is coming out Wednesday to turn that on. <laughs> Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, I'll bet a lot of people actually like the fog signal. Like you said, that it kind of adds to the uh, the overall ambience of the place. That's not such a bad thing at all. Now, what did happen this year with the pandemic? Has the lighthouse been open for stays this past summer? We were open up until the day of quarantine, uh, March 16th, I believe. And we kept optimistic month after month thinking this was going to go away, um, not canceling reservations ahead of time, um, just doing it by the month because we really were hopeful, as everyone has been, that this would be over soon. But in July, well, about June, we had to really accept facts, and we have closed out for the rest of this year. That's too bad. Hopefully things will be sort of, at least sort of back to normal by, by next year. We're all hoping for that by next summer anyway. So as I mentioned a couple of times, I visited the island in 2015. I loved the experience, but I, I, I told you this, I think when we went back and forth by email earlier, I was a little surprised by the, uh, the drive there. I had good directions and I followed the directions, but I was surprised by the length of the road that goes out there to the Point uh, San Pablo uh, Yacht Harbor. And it was very windy and, and not the best road in the world. Uh, and you told me that the road has been repaved since I was there five years ago. Is that correct? That is correct. We have had a change in ownership at the harbor, and they've really been sprucing the place up. It's a tremendous attraction for people who live locally. They have a wonderful restaurant there as well. Um, they have lots of art installation. They've got a huge farm going, so it's, you know, organic farm-to-table food. And they paved the road, the whole road. And as you mentioned, it is a long and winding road to <laughs> Costa Vida. That should be a sign. Uh, <laughs> but it's paved now, which is amazing because, you know, as you experienced, the gravel was a little tricky. And the drive there is confusing, even though there are explicit directions you can get lost. You can think that you're lost, and perhaps hearing the banjos playing deliverance music. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's been improving all the time. We're really grateful uh, that they're bringing that harbor back to life. Yeah, well, that's great. And when I was there, I waited in the uh, the restaurant bar there for the boat ride I was scheduled to take, and uh, it was an interesting place, kind of colorful at that time. I think I was greeted by a dog. Do I remember? I think I remember a dog being there. That There's was very... lots of dogs. <laughs> well, inside the place. The harbor. <laughs> yeah, very, very friendly dog. I also understand that that location was used in the John Wayne movie, Blood Alley. Uh, maybe you could say something about that. But before you do, there are also a lot of houseboats in the water near there. I don't know if that's changed, but... Well, let me, let's let's talk about one thing at a time here. Would you like to comment on the uh, the the movie that was made there, Blood Alley? Is that something that that uh, people ask about? We like to kind of share it with them because not everybody knows that. It's a little bit of trivia on the way, sort of thing. There's a lot of history on the way uh, to the island, but while you're driving just right out of the jetty, you know, like uh, you can see, especially in low tide the old the old bones of the ship that they used in the movie. So there's a scene where the ship gets set up ablaze and it's on fire. Um, and that was filmed right there. And we passed that location on the way to the island and back. So it's kind of cool to, to point that out. And then people can see the, the markers for the ship that are still there. And um, hopefully they, they go home and watch Blood Alley and say, I was there in that water. Yeah, you know, I don't think I've ever seen that movie, but now I feel I got to track it down and and watch it. So, as I mentioned, there were a lot of houseboats in the the harbor at that time. Is that still the case today? It is still the case. A lot of the residents just kind of remained, even though there was a switch in ownership. And then we've gotten a couple of new, colorful extra um, boats, houseboats, people that just add to the 
you know, the experience. Yeah, it was pretty unique. I don't think I've ever seen another place that looked quite like it. And uh, I was looking at the a website that made it look like the restaurant and bar has been, you said it has new ownership. Has it been renovated since I was there five years ago? Yes, it has. And it it was Novelist prior to the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And that was a finer diner. It was more gourmet and food in a diner-esque setting. Okay. But it was a really nice combination. Now it is Black Star Pig. And it's more barbecue oriented. It reopened for the weekends right now because there's a lot of outdoor. So it's able to mm-hmm. be safe for social distancing. And I'm telling you, it's packed every single day. I'm glad to hear that it's been fixed up. Yeah, it's it's got a beautiful artistic flair to it now. Are there tours available of the island and lighthouse for people who might not want to stay overnight if they just want to go out there on a, a day trip? We're talking not during the pandemic? Yes, right. Forget the pandemic for now. Okay. In, in okay. <laughs> more, uh, more normal times, are people able to go out and take a tour without staying overnight? Yes. During nice weather, which we're very fortunate to have three seasons out of the year, there are day trips available on the weekend. So it's a little four-hour stint. You come out, and um, you can either bring your picnic lunch with you, or you can pay a little extra, and the keepers will provide uh, lunch for you while you're there. Stay the four hours, and then you go back when it's time to pick up the guests. Okay, that's good. So do you have events, uh, things like weddings? I imagine there must be weddings on the island and maybe business meetings. Do people do that sort of thing there? Again, not this year, but uh, in most years. Uh, Yes, we do, actually. Uh, It depends, again, on the keepers uh, Mm -hmm. because they, they get to decide how much of an extra workload they want. And they really are working from sunup till sunrise every day. Um, maintaining things and running the bed and breakfast. But we have had weddings and we have had business meetings. In fact, I had a business retreat for my company out here on the island a couple of years ago and everyone was just in love, of course. You've referred to the resident caretakers or keepers uh, a few times and I know that for quite a few years you've had caretakers or keepers living on the island and managing the the B&B. Not too long ago, the search for new innkeepers or keepers, caretakers, uh, got a lot of publicity in uh, the press. And uh, I I do uh, weekly online news for the U.S. Lighthouse Society. I was posting stuff about it. And I understand a couple was hired at the end of that search. And maybe you could say a little bit about the that search for caretakers. And I guess the, the couple that was there left early this year because of the situation. So typically, our keepers average about two, two and a half years. Sometimes longer, sometimes less, but that's about the average. I've gone through maybe six sets of keepers as a board member, uh, so six sets of interviews. And once we weeded out all the applicants because the the qualifications are very strict. Um, Once we've weeded those out, typically we've got about six to eight qualified candidates that we can really interview in earnest. However, as you mentioned, the search for the keepers went viral. It brought a lot of attention to the island, which was wonderful as far as, you know, getting the bookings up and getting the interest up. That was the reward of it going viral. But for us, on the working end, we had, I'm not even exaggerating these numbers here, between emails and phone calls and applicants. Let me guess. Let me guess how many inquiries you had. I'll bet it was over a thousand. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Okay. Tens of thousands from all over the world because it went viral. No one was reading the job posting. Uh, They were just interested in the job, wanted to apply, you know, so we have to look at them all. We have to be fair, but it was so consuming. By the end of it, we had 60 qualified applicants that we had to interview. (laughs) Aside from the regular lives and jobs, we were interviewing maybe three or four times a week. Wow. So that was tremendous. We did have it narrowed down several several applicants that were qualified that you know we liked 
and then it came down to um, Tyler and Tiffany being hired. They were in Napa at the time, so not having to completely relocate. The keepers before them were in New Zealand, so they had to re completely relocate. And Tiffany and Tyler hit the ground running, but of course everything came to a crashing halt this year, and they moved back to the East Coast where they're from um, to start whatever their next adventure is. I'm not that surprised you had that many uh, inquiries because uh, I get emails all the time from people wanting to live and or work at a lighthouse. And I, you know, it's not that many that offer those kinds of opportunities. So uh, the fact that your search got so, such wide publicity, I, I, I'm not surprised that it brought, brought so much attention. So uh, Tiffany and Tyler must have been disappointed, though, that the season ended so early this year. You know, we were all disappointed. I don't think any of us were ready for anything like this. No, none of us were. Let's talk about volunteers in general. Besides the keepers that you hire to run the place, do you also have volunteers? Yes. Um, as I mentioned, we have a volunteer program, mm -hmm. uh, the Wikis. Right. And they come every month, second Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, we also will have big projects, capital improvements that need to happen. Those aren't so much volunteers, you know, that, that gets paid for. But we do have people that have to come out and, and do stuff. Next month, we are replacing the copper roof on the tower. And there's one person, essentially, in the United States that does that sort of um, historic copper roof installation anymore. Mm -hmm. So... That's going to be a fun project, yeah. and we have Visit Richmond to thank for donating the funds to that improvement. Wow. Well, that's great. Are you actively, again, uh, the little footnote to this, uh, or asterisk, I should say, it's this year is different, but in a normal year, are you usually looking for more volunteers to help out? And part two, how can people find out about that if they're interested? We are always looking for volunteers. We've got our, you know, our main steadies who have been consistent year after year, but we need new blood in there sometimes, and not everyone can give up an entire Saturday to work, and so we're always looking for volunteers. We have jobs for all skill levels, and we have on our website, www.ebls.org, if you're interested in signing up to become a volunteer, what that does is it places you on a list. You receive the evite every month. You come that month if you can. You don't if you can't. There will be wiki days every month, no matter what. So I'm on your email list. Uh, being in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, I can't exactly volunteer for you very easily. I would love to, but uh, it's fun keeping up on the news, what's going on there. So I enjoy being on the list. I have one more question for you for bonus points. So get your thinking cap on. Okay. What is your personal favorite thing about your work with East Brother Light Station? Before the pandemic, it was the opportunity to put my love into this building, this island, reaching masses, even via social media, informing people and bringing other people to the island so that they could experience the magic. But since I've been living here, I have, I'm going to get all emotional. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's understandable. I've found that it gives me an incredible, overwhelming sense of gratitude and appreciation that I am here. I have this opportunity. You know, we opened the bed and breakfast in 1980, and it's always been sort of a, a place where you're, you're going to work if you're going to live here. You know, you're going to be the keeper. You've got the guests to take care of. I'm the first person in decades to, to just be here keeping it, taking care of it, watching it, living here, enjoying it talking to the seagulls and the and the you know the birds and the I'm so grateful I every day that's my favorite thing right now yeah I completely understand and uh your love for it is just so so obvious are you there by yourself much or most of the time right now most of the time I'm here alone but we do have a captain um captain Jared Ward uh he comes to 
do all the the guy stuff, all the machinery mm-hmm. stuff, and I, I get on swimmingly with him. So that's been wonderful too. It's quite a unique experience for the both of us. Desiree Hevero, I, I want to thank you so much. It's been a pleasure meeting you via Skype today. And I, as I said uh, a couple of times today, it's I had such a good time when I visited there five years ago. And I really do hope to get back, and I hope I can stay overnight the next time. Maybe I can be with my wife the next time I, I get out there. Uh, it's just, it is a special place, a snow globe of a lighthouse. <laughs> it's very special, and uh, it was uh, truly a pleasure, as I said. And I wish you all the luck in the world as far as, uh, well, I wish all of us luck with the pandemic, and I hope things get back to normal, not too distant future for you. But in the meantime, keep enjoying the place. And thank you so much, Desiree. I expect to see you out here. You'd better come out here and enjoy yourself. And yeah, I mean, unselfishly, I do hope the pandemic's over soon, but selfishly, maybe not so soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are a lighthouse keeper in a, in a true sense in many ways, a 21st century lighthouse keeper. Thank you again, Desiree. Thanks, Jeremy. Now it's time for another installment of Florida Lighthouse History with Ralph Krugler. Ralph is the historian for the Hillsborough Lighthouse Preservation Society and also a volunteer for the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Today's subject is the interesting life of Alfred Alexander Burgell, the first keeper of Hillsborough Inlet Lighthouse. Here's Ralph. Hi again, everybody. I'm Ralph Krugler, the historian for the Hillsborough Inlet Lighthouse. Alongside me, as always, is my faithful dog, Wiki, and today we're going to delve into a portion of a keeper's life in a slightly different way than you might be expecting. The year was 1903, or a very early 1904. Living in Brooklyn, New York, was a young woman named Mary Gertrude Leverich. Born in 1879 into a well-to-do family, she was educated in living the life that her parents planned. The one thing they couldn't have accounted for, though, was her belief and insistence that she should be able to choose her own path in life. One day while reading the newspaper, an article caught her eye and captured her imagination. The story may have been about lighthouse keepers in general, a region, a particular tower, or a chosen few keepers. The article has been lost to time, and sadly no amount of internet searches has yet to provide a copy, so we're left to ponder. However, one thing is for certain. It featured an account of a certain keeper. It must have told a dashing tale of action and adventure, just the sort of thing a proper young lady shouldn't partake in, but Mary craved. It spoke of a man who was Swedish by heritage, grew up in Wasta, Finland, and was under the rule of the Russians. The article in question probably didn't mention that as a child he was part of a group of boys who took to the water to race crew. Those are the long, shallow draft boats propelled by several people rowing in tandem. And when the Russian Tsar would bring his family to Wasta for vacations, his youngest son, the future Tsar Nicholas II, would be aboard Burgell's boat for the rides. But I digress. The article moved her so much that she was determined to meet the subject of the story. Besides the objections of her parents, there was a greater issue that she'd have to overcome. She was living in New York while the lighthouse keeper was in Key West, Florida. Well, that's when he was his turn on the rotation to go ashore. The rest of the time he was the principal keeper on the Rebecca Shoal Lighthouse, a small cottage-style lighthouse sitting upon screw pile posts offshore in the waters of the southernmost key of Florida, earning only $700 a year. Undeterred by her parents' objections, she booked passage heading south. Upon her arrival at Key West, she would have easily found the U.S. Lighthouse Depot amongst the hustle and bustle of the active seaport. There she would have been able to contact the object of her fascination. She may have had to wait a couple of weeks, though, for his rotation to come up, but then it finally happened. She was face to face with Alfred Alexander Burgell. A romance ignited and soon they were on their way to New York. Burgell, being a man of honor, felt it was his duty to meet her parents and ask for her hand in marriage. We're not exactly sure what happened, but according to their grandson, Bob Regal, the family was, well, let's say none too pleased with the thought of their daughter marrying this guy who's only earning $700 a year. But Mary was headstrong, and on May 27, 1904, in Kings, New York, the pair were married. They returned to Key West and purchased a home for the blushing bride. Burgell continued his work in the lighthouse service and in 1905 was transferred to the American Shoal Lighthouse, increasing his pay to $820 a year. Like Rebecca Shoal, it's an offshore light in the Florida Keys, leaving Mary to continue living in their home in Key West. 
The pair was a founding member of the Christian Science Church in Key West, which still exists today, which gave her a social outlet. Life for Bergale at the American Shoal Lighthouse was routine until August 6, 1905, when a mosquito bite infected him with dengue fever. The station boat was in Key West, and despite flying a distress flag, no schooner would stop. For 15 long, miserable days, he suffered in the metal sweat box. In the oppressive tropical heat and humidity, broken only by occasional ocean breezes, didn't help break his fever, so the suffering continued until finally getting a ride to Key West in a nice long hospital stay. Bergill wanted to live with his wife and young son, Alfred Jr., so when it was reported that a new land-based lighthouse was being built on the Hillsborough Inlet, he applied for and was awarded transfer as a principal keeper there. Being a land-based tower, he would also take a $20 reduction in annual pay. Life was hard at first. The station was plagued with horsefly infestations until window screening material was finally delivered several months later. The couple had two more children while at the lighthouse, Mary Esther, born in 1907, and Axel Cuthbert in 1908. But either due to distance or resentment, Mary's parents did not venture down to meet their grandchildren. Instead, they kept in touch via infrequent letters. Fortunately, one of them still exists, which was provided by Bergel's granddaughter, Lauren Essex, who still lives in Florida today. The text reveals that some correspondence had previously occurred, and perhaps tensions in the family were finally resolving. It read, My dear mother, The hibiscus which flowers the most is about three feet high. It often has half a dozen blossoms at a time. What does James say of Francis and George and of their mother, or has he not seen them? I think little Lester must be a very attractive child. You like the little photograph? I will tell you more of Alfred's people. Some of this you may already know, much of I did not know myself until recently. Alfred's father was one of the wealthiest men in Finland. He also held one of the highest official positions held by a Finlander. No one was superior to him in office excepting the Governor General, a Russian appointed by the Tsar. He was what might be called a Lieutenant Governor of the northern half of Finland. His first wife was of the nobility. All of her children were grown before Alfred was born. Alfred speaks well of them. Alfred's mother was about 18 when she married. Her husband was about 45. Alfred says that she and her sister were famous for their beauty. Her father was a wealthy minister of the Lutheran Church, the established church, and almost all of the men in their family had been ministers for hundreds of years. Two and perhaps more of Alfred's uncles are ministers. The clergy of the established church are of the same social standing as the nobility and have large estates. He said his grandfather used to keep nine servants and other things were in proportion. Until Alfred was a little boy, his parents had three homes, a large white stone house in the city, a villa in the islands, and a country estate. His mother had 14 servants. When he was a child, his father was financially ruined and before long, died. Then his mother did most nobly in supporting the large family. Hannah the eldest was married. Henry was sent to relatives in St. Petersburg and grew up among the nobility at the capital with relatives. They called him the Little Prince. Hilma stayed at home, helped her mother, and never married. Hugo graduated from university and was offered a chair in advanced mathematics preferred not to teach, and was given the position of state geologist for Finland. Ada, the youngest, married, had only one child, who died at birth. Alfred had, for godfathers, two intimate friends of his father's, one worth 30 millions, the other a count. I think both are dead. A picture of the son of the count was in the Review of Reviews, also a number of other Finlanders, all of whom Alfred knew, some of which he had gone to kindergarten with. When Alfred was still a boy, he was eager to be self-supporting to help his mother. Daring and loving adventure, it was quite natural that he should wish to go to sea, when in proportion to the population, more seamen go from Finland than any other country. Hannah's husband, because of ill health, had purchased a vessel and went around the world trading, so Alfred's mother consented to his going along with them. They kept him in the cabin with them and treated him as a cabin passenger. But Alfred was so eager to be independent that he took all his belongings and went and slept in the hold with the sailors. So his brother-in-law, anxious to make him tired of sea life, was very severe with him and made him work like a man. But Alfred would not give in. So when he returned, his mother decided if he would follow the sea, he must be educated as fully as possible for his work and sent him to the navigational school. Graduates of which are received as officers in the Russian Navy. Alfred graduated and was given his rank. He left the Navy because of the incident of which he told you. 
At a large dance, a Russian officer insulted the lady with whom Alfred was dancing. Alfred, with his sword, tore off the officer's insignias of rank and defaced the Russian eagle. The officer, one of high rank, was degraded to the ranks for permitting the Russian eagle to be defaced, and Alfred was in danger of arrest. His uncle, the senator, a life of office in Finland, sent him a passport and advised him to leave the country that night, which he did. The college students of Finland, like those of other countries, are wild and full of serious pranks, especially aggressive in their attitude towards the Russian officers, particularly when they feel offense has been offered. They consider this mere patriotism. Alfred accepted a position as a first officer on a merchant vessel. He passed captain's examinations, but being only 19, could not hold position until he was of age. Afterwards, as you know, he became a captain of a vessel, of which he was part owner, and traded going around the world four times. Then his illness in Australia occurred. At first, he paid $25 a week for a private room in a hospital, and being considered incurable for three years, his funds were finally exhausted. When he grew better, he went to his uncle in San Francisco, who also spent several thousand dollars, sending him to health resorts for a year or more. When he recovered, Alfred became a wheat buyer, doing well financially, but not able to conduct business with the principal, who was dishonest. So he came to the seacoast, intending to set sail for Finland. A friend suggested he entered the lighthouse service, which he did. Thinking it a good opportunity to save money, having a little occasion to spend, because he did not wish to return home empty-handed. He paid his uncle's children, the uncle had died, all that he had owed him, although his uncle had told him he not need ever return the money. When he was a student, he belonged to a dramatic society which gave theatricals in a hall seating about 2,000. With very much love to all the family, and especially yourself, I am always yours affectionately, Mary Gertrude Brigell. Fort Lauderdale, Florida, October 27th, 1908. That letter omitted several things. First of all, Brigell's mother did not want him to go to sea ever, and it was a plot between her and her daughter and son-in-law to make Brigell's life miserable on the trip to New York. And when he went below deck, he had to earn the respect of the crewmen, so he became a swab, and despite what the brother-in-law was saying and doing to him, the crew saw a hard-working, dedicated young man and actually encouraged him in his work. Also, the night of the... Uh, a dance hall incident that came on the night of his graduation from the academy had he stayed his life would have been forever one of hardship and pain toiling away in a siberian prison and there he would have stayed until he eventually died next comes the illness where he was recovering in australia the illness actually left him partially deaf and unable to properly captain a ship which is why he gave up the profession next came his journey to san francisco during the trip, a fire broke out in the hold, but the crew, hating their captain so much, refused his orders. But Bergel took charge, and soon the flames were quickly extinguished. For his efforts, a fellow passenger gave him his gold watch as a means of thanks. This is a watch he would wear for the rest of his life. His lighthouse career would come to an end at Hillsborough in 1911 due to a lack of support from his supervisor, several worthless assistants, and a possible plot to assassinate him. That's a story for another day. When his honor was impugned in the lighthouse service, he simply resigned. Bergill had an interesting life after attending the Wicks and passed away in California on February 20th, 1939. He was later joined by Mary on June 9th, 1951. Well, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it. So on behalf of Wiki, this is Ralph Kruger saying thanks and we'll see you next time. Later. Thanks to today's guests, Desiree Hevero and Ralph Krugler. And thanks to everyone all over the world who helps the U.S. Lighthouse Society in its mission to preserve our lighthouses and to educate people about them. To learn more about the Society, go to uslhs.org. And if you enjoy this podcast, please remember that it's made possible by donations to the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Ron Daigle once wrote, quote, If you cannot change the course of the storm, be the lighthouse, unquote. Thank you to everyone everywhere who works in any way to save lighthouses or to educate people about them. We're all on the same team. If you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. As always, thank you very much for listening and keep a good light. Shine, let it shine, let it shine. All in my house, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine.
shine, let it shine.